Hey everybody, Mary Grothy here, CEO of Sales BQ. Welcome to this episode of the Quota Crusher podcast. Today, I have a friend, I have a guest here who's going to enlighten all of us in the world of building sales systems and also the importance of marketing because, oh, we're going to get into it. But you know, gone are the days of that sales unicorn who gets hired and is supposed to do everything as it relates to sales and marketing. Mm -mm, doesn't work that way anymore. We're going to dig into that. I'd like to welcome our guest to the show, Javier Lozano, who is the National Director of Business Development at CMI here in Denver with me. Welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing, Mary? Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about uh, this podcast. I've listened to a few of your episodes and I got to say, I love your energy. I love the content that you're putting out there. You're doing some great stuff. Uh, and I mean, more importantly, what I love about it is, is how much of a leader you really are um, and you're just breaking all sorts of barriers. So I really appreciate you even taking the time to have me on the podcast. You know, that's really sweet. You just <laughs> built me up. Now I feel really great about myself. <laughs> Yeah. I might need to uh, I might need to call you every morning so that I can <laughs> kickstart my day that great. Um, fun story is you were referred to me by interacting with one of our clients and actually one of my team members who yep. uh, Greg Queen, who's our one of our VPs out on the East Coast, and you met Greg and one of our clients at a trade show. They got to talk to you that they said, You need to meet Mary. And I remember getting the first email from you thinking, Who is this guy? And what does he want? And why am I supposed to be talking to him? And I have Greg and Scott in my ear. You have to talk to him. You have to talk to him. And then I've seen your email. Like, I'm so confused. Whatever. I'm just going to have a meeting. And we had a great time sitting down. I think that you and I share in a lot of similar common beliefs. And I would love for you to introduce yourself. Give us a brief overview of your background so that the audience can learn who you are. Yeah. Um, just kind of recap on, on your end where, you know, I met with Greg and, and, um, <clears throat> and Scott and those guys are amazing. I mean, Greg is an amazing uh, person, super brilliant as far as his sales systems and how he, he really integrates the marketing and sales. He understands that and he communicates that very well. And I think that's one of the reasons why we just hit it off. Um, and then Scott, I, I mean, he's literally like 15 minutes down the road from me. Too bad we can't have a beer right now, but we could probably have a virtual beer. Um, so anyways, those guys are great. I love, I love talking to them and I still talk to Scott on a regular basis. But, um, you know, more about my background, I basically uh, ran a company for just over 10 years, uh, started it in 2008, uh, and then sold it in 2018. Uh, just to kind of give a background on that part is when I started the company in 2008, I signed a lease in March of 2008. We opened doors in August 2008, and then the recession was official in September 2008. And it was a five-year lease, personal guarantee. That was the only way I was actually going to be able to open my doors for my business. And... At that point, you know, I opened it at an anchor store. So I was like, all right, this will be my marketing budget, if you will, because it's an anchor store. And then all the stores around that anchor store started shutting down. Uh, so essentially, I had to get really, really good and strategic on my sales and marketing strategies, or I could just fold old 300K before I'm 30. Um, so I, you know, chose the, you know, getting really good at sales and marketing and essentially developed a system that was clockwork. Um, it was, it was great it, it, to the point where, you know, we would get leads, they'd get funneled into, you know, phone calls immediately to appointments to signing up. And we got to the point where we were closing 90% of our people that were actually um, coming into our building. And some people don't believe that on a sales side, but it's all about how you create your systems and how you pre-qualify people. So you don't waste your time with the tire kickers and you focus your time with the people that actually are going to be a part of your business because at the end of the day you want to put your energy to people that want to do business with you not with the ones that don't want to do business with you um and that's kind of what i did and so i guess you know best way i kind of put it i got really good at it and to the point where when we were looking at selling in 2018 um i didn't have any people that were really interested in being a broker because they think that this business was wrapped around me and then as soon as they saw the systems, the numbers, uh, everything, they're like, this is insane. I've never seen anyone do this. So we started putting numbers together. I was fortunate enough to start the valuation of having that business set at 2x valuation, um, which isn't very normal in my industry. Um, it was martial arts and personal training. And again, this is not a brag thing. It's just more of systems really matter in your business because you never know if you're ever going to sell. When I opened my business, I didn't expect to sell. I expected to be doing until I was like 50 or 60. 
And then 10 years later, two kids and a wife, I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe my priorities slightly shifted. Uh, so sold it uh, and then kind of did a little bit of consulting. Uh, didn't realize this. I talked to my wife about this. I was probably grieving for a few months because I built something that was my baby. And then after talking to some other people, just like two weeks ago, I kid you not, they kind of were telling me that a lot of people that sell their business, they grieve. And I was like, oh my God, I grieved in most of 2018 and had no idea. Um, so that's something that's uh, eye-opening. And then decided to kind of apply my stuff towards CMI Mechanical. And that's what I'm doing now. I, it's, some people ask me like, do you have a background in HVAC and refrigeration? I don't. I know how to turn my thermostat on. That's about it. And I got really good at the marketing and the sales stuff that when we started kind of talking, I started showing them how we could create systems. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I'm kind of in charge of a big chunk of business. I'm trying to you know, keep ourselves in front of our, our um, prospects and then our, our current customers. So that's kind of what it is in a nutshell. Yeah, that's so powerful, this story. Knowing that systems, the systems that you built created predictable, sustainable revenue and revenue is king when selling a business, not necessarily cash. Because when you're looking at evaluation, depending on the type of company you have, they mm -hmm. are looking at your profit or EBITDA, but they are looking at contracts or sustainability of the business. And if you are a company that has really great contracts, really great forecasted or secured revenue long-term, of course, that's where the value of your business is going to significantly increase. And something else that you did was so powerful here is that you built a company that could run without you. Yep. And most owners build a company that's wild, wild, wildly dependent upon them being a part of it, them running it, them being the face of it them leading them whatever however they're integrated in the business and it makes the sale of the business very difficult because you look forward with the new owner saying the only reason this company has customers is because of the current owner how will i be able to step in and win the trust of the client base retain their business your answer to that was creating systems and it was yep. creating a process that had lead flow that had conversion that had proven marketing, you had the right SEO, you had the right rankings, you had the right visual presence. You also had the conversion rates where they needed to be to justify any spend on marketing. Then the sales process, once that qualified lead came either through the door or on the phone or through the website or whatnot, you then had a sales process to get it to a close. And you weren't fully responsible for that. You're able to have staff replicate that. It was able to be performed and you weren't setting the business up for failure. And I think that that type of advice is very, very powerful, especially for business owners. Looking at myself, most people start a company because they have great passion for what they do. And they're an evangelist and they are predominantly the reason why they secure new clients. We call it the CEO sale. You mm -hmm. don't even have to be good at sales, but the fact yep. that you're the owner, you know your product or service and the problem that you solve more intimately than anyone on your team. The amount of trust you're able to create out of the gate with a prospect is very powerful and therefore conversions are a lot easier. But how do you replicate that to someone else handling business development, marketing, and sales? So you truly did a phenomenal job creating this, building it out. And you obviously saw that with a successful sale. So talk to me about now that you're more in uh, outside of martial arts and personal training and some of that B2C world, now you're in the world of B2B. Yep. And how did your sales system building and marketing system building experience, how did that translate into now working with CMI Mechanical? Because sometimes you hear that B2C experience is so different from B2B experience in the world of sales and marketing. What did you bring forth from that time that has already resulted in success for you? Yeah. And you know, this is the biggest thing that kind of, I would say kind of upsets me is that a lot of people think that B2C and B2B is completely two different animals. At the end of the day, it's human to human. Like the last time I checked, when I sold to a, a business, there was a human being on the other side. Okay, there were decision makers that you have to hit emotional pain points to helpful to hopefully win their business. I don't care if, if they're an executive. I don't care if they're just, you know, the person two or three notches below the executive. My point being is, is that it's about how you communicate. It's about how you pull out certain pain points. And so 
yes, I would say to a degree B to C is a little bit more tougher because you're directing with a, you're, you're, you're working with a larger customer base and you're trying to influence more people. B to B is, I would say probably a longer sales process, but then you're going to have more strategic conversations. But at the end of the day, in my opinion, if you're doing it correctly, you're, you're really focusing on the pain points of your customer because at the end of the day, if, if, if you can't solve a problem, then what is your business going to do? And so what I kind of saw is, is that I got really good at solving pain points at my old company and started asking the right questions. I mean, to the point where I'm asking these questions in almost in a roundabout way, you continue asking these questions over and over again, but in different formats. And all of a sudden you start peeling back the layers of problems. You know, another way of doing this is that you ask common questions that you know what the answer are going to be, but then you hear the actual person say it out loud. That person, all of a sudden, when they say it, they understand that there's a problem and then you provide a solution, you know, like best example is like whenever I was, you know, I had a, a prospect that became a client. Um, we were doing a, a pre-qualification call. And then from there, she came in and did her appointment. She needed personal training. She wanted to lose a, a, a severe amount of weight. Um, during the actual sales process, she cried. At that point, I knew I had her hooked. And I didn't, I'm not saying that in a like, that's that sales guy in me. I'm saying that, that there was an emotional attachment to what she was trying to achieve. I kept asking questions to see what was going on. And the next thing you know, she became a complete different person. You know, a year later, she lost 100 pounds. Um, she became an advocate of the business. She was like, she was the, the, you know, what we would consider is like a, a true success story and her confidence skyrocketed. Um, she was just happy. So where I'm coming from is, is that I, you know, asked a lot of questions, solve what those, and saw what those things are, and then started kind of putting some pain points out in front and then seeing what she had to say. That is the same thing with B2B. And it literally is, especially like, you know, I look at it in the HVC refriger refrigeration world where I'm currently in is a lot of the pain points a lot of these people are going through are technicians aren't reliable or you know they have prices all over the board or they don't know if they're overpaying or there's so many different things and what i do is i start asking more questions and it seems as though i'm just being like annoying and i don't understand i want them to reveal things that they don't know and then as as soon as i hear a certain keyword or something that kind of like sticks i go okay that is it and then i provide a slight solution how you can fix that and then that kind of starts driving the conversation forward. Um, so that's one of the things like during my, I guess you could say marketing and sales process. But the other part that a lot of people I think miss out on, and I'm seeing it a lot in the B2B world, is, is staying in front of your customer. A lot of people think that staying in front of your customer it takes too much time. If you create the right systems, you don't have to do that. It takes time to create it. It's not fun, okay? But what is really fun is developing this entire process that when it's, it's all done, it's all automated. And that's kind of the goal. So what I'm talking about is I created, you know, email automation. So as soon as the lead comes in for our company at CMI Mechanical, they get a phone call within 24 hours. Okay. Sometimes actually less. Okay. And then on the thank you page, it basically has my big picture with call me now with my cell phone and my email address, and I'm not kidding you, we've had people literally call me. They're like, hey, I'm on your thank you page. I'm calling you now. I was like, cool. So I have a call to action very clear to the point, not kind of take me to a page like, where am I? And then after that, they get a series of seven emails that is trying to get them to set up an appointment with me because we needed to talk about they're going to be a good fit for our company. If none of that happens, like where I call them a couple times, and after those seven emails, they don't, you know, reply back or, or set an appointment, then they get into what I call as a lead nurture campaign. So over the next 52 weeks, yes, 52 weeks, they'll be getting one email per week. Okay. And so that's all automated. I cr created all this content where once a week on Tuesday at 6am, they'll be getting an email and I'm okay. If they don't open it, I'm okay. If they read it, I'm okay. I don't care, but there's no pitch. It's simply just education, value building, uh, branding, and then it builds and it takes everyone back to the website, it takes people back to the website so that I'm always in front. At one point, they're going to say, I keep getting these emails from this high viewer guy at See My Mechanical. We should at least talk to them. So those are some of the things that I kind of believe that is really simple to do that I created 
in a B2C world and it really translates over easily in the B2B world, but a lot of people aren't doing that because they don't have the time. And that's unfortunate because if you develop the time to do it, then it's going to reap a lot of benefits. Yeah. It is. It is. So this is just a further expansion of the system. And I'm going to hit on two things that you said specifically, and then we're going to talk about gone are the days of the sales unicorn. One is the statement about buyer commitment. You didn't use this term, but I'm going to use the term buyer commitment. Okay. When you were sharing the story about the woman who finally hit the point of realization where she was super emotionally bought in, yep. that's where buyer commitment comes from. And I believe that too many salespeople, whether it's B2C, B2B, they skip past this step. They do their process and they say, I did my process. I don't know why they didn't buy. And I would go back and say, did we ever get a firm commitment? Not a, hey, I want to move forward with you, but the buyer commitment where you could see the pivot in the change, where the shift occurred in the sales conversation to where the salesperson has passed the baton of enthusiasm and belief that they can solve their problem and the buyer finally believes you can solve my problem. That's where the shift happens. It may not be indicated with words like, hey, I'm committed and I'm ready to buy. Wouldn't that be nice <laughs> if every buyer was so honest with us? But it is, it, it's a shift. It's a pivot in the buyer's body language and their word choice and their tonality and their emotional state in new urgency or the way that they're asking questions. It yep. could be just a whole shift in the conversation. And if salespeople aren't setting awareness to look for that or to watch for that, they may not pick up on that shift, which is critical to ensuring that you're continuing to get the, the buyer's commitment all the way through execution and closing the sale. So that was really cool that you brought that up. I wanted to expand on that a little bit. You also yeah. made this statement about people who believe B2C is so wildly different from B2B. I think that when you're looking at certain components of B2C sales versus B2B, I would argue that they are wildly different. What I would say is similar is the concept of foundational sales philosophy I agree. of how you get a buyer to a buying decision. I think that when you look at systems, when you look at the way that you're marketing, when you look at the way that you're uh, what type of sales talent, it could be more transactional, it could be volume based versus what you might more typically see in B2B be more relationship based. Also, there might be more complexities in B2B. You may have all the way up to enterprise companies and procurement teams and different ways people buy and RFPs, things that you may not have in the B2C world. So there are certainly different pieces that are wildly different, but at the core, it is sales and it is transferring the enthusiasm from the salesperson to the buyer to get the commitment. And there is, it is human to human. And I thought that that was really powerful because sometimes I think as salespeople, we remove that aspect of it, especially when a great sales system or process is created. I was working with a team yesterday and the BDR, the business development rep who's responsible for prospecting, outbound prospecting and handling inbounds was amazing on the training and made the statement that he gets flustered if anything goes off the script and he just feels more comfortable following the script. And I think to myself, sometimes if you have a well-planned process or scripted process or whatnot, are you holding your salespeople back? And I think that there's a really great process of teaching people, scripting, wording, uh, decision trees, pivoting, and looking at, hey, if the call goes here, go here. I think that's a lot of that should be brought in from a training perspective, but not an ongoing sales enablement perspective, I, that that's I what totally they rely agree. on. Yep. And I think like when you're stuck on a script, how are you having a human conversation? Because last time I checked, very few human conversations were scripted. And I think you, lot of, you brought a lot of power into what you just shared. So let's transition and talk about the sales unicorn. I gave a presentation shortly before uh, the world was put on quarantine. And I made a presentation to in a, in a room full of, uh, gosh, probably 50 entrepreneurs, CEOs, executives. And I talked about the sales unicorn and I saw a level of engagement of people listening to me. And I was very pleased. We talked about the sales unicorn and this is the person who historically was hired maybe a decade or two ago that has a pretty decent base salary. And as a part of that leadership expects them 
oh, what does their base salary cover? Well, it covers your ability to build your own prospect database completely from scratch without any paid for tools. So go searching on the internet, use your free resources, potentially LinkedIn premium, whatnot, build your own list, go out and go networking, um, find contacts manually, enter them potentially into a CRM or an Excel spreadsheet manually, have no automation for outbound emails, cadences, tracking workflow in your prospecting efforts, but make sure you are tracking and doing like a 16 touch point cadence for your people at a minimum. And then you also then need to be responsible for booking all of your meetings, doing the qualification discovery, demo or solution presentation, taking it to a close after building your proposal, and then potentially being the relationship manager on the back end. <laughs> well, this is, I, I just feel like gone are the days of the sales person of yesteryear. Those yes. people, one, those type of skill sets aren't being nurtured and grown as a whole in people. So a crazy thing happened several years ago, maybe, maybe we'll call it five years ago. I went back into the workforce in 20, end of 2014 after owning a company for three years. And I took on a full-time B2B mid-market SaaS uh, sales role. And I noticed at that time that sales had started to change and that people had sales engines built. They had people working top of funnel, marketing was working differently to help for sales. That was back at the end of 2014, it's 2020 now. And I was able to start working on building out what was turning into a real sales engine for the company I was working for. And that's what really prompted SalesBQ to be born and what we've done with our clients. And now even just looking at how we've evolved, because back when we started SalesBQ end of 2017, I was still okay with leaders having that old mind state of we can find a sales unicorn and we actually built playbooks and we built uh, sales processes around that. And then I started to feel like we have been held back. We have been held back in this because we don't have access to marketing. We don't have a budget for technology automation. We are not automating processes that should be automated. And we're spending a whole lot of money on expensive labor and expensive salespeople and base salaries that really most salespeople don't like prospecting. In fact, the percentage of salespeople that have a true hunter mentality versus those with more of a farmer or an account manager mentality, it, it, it's, it's very small, the amount of people with a pure hunter mentality. And if you're relying on them to build their pipeline, it's just not going to happen. So that's why a lot of companies bring SalesBQ in because their sales team's not performing. And yep. they come in and they think through training and coaching, we're gonna do this magic. Well, honestly, you could spend a lot of money on that with any sales trainer, but if you're not actually looking at the core, the root cause of the problem, you don't have hunters, you have salespeople that are wildly talented and experienced with preset qualified discovery meetings through close. Let them shine and work on where they flourish and quit asking them to do 75% of their work week at a super high price on work that they don't like doing, they're not good at doing, they're not energized at doing, and they're going to find a thousand other things to distract them to avoid doing it. And then you have to employ this whole management layer to try to get people to manage people to do work that they're absolutely not going to do. And it's very expensive. You could just take all that money that you're continuing to throw out the window and put it towards inbound marketing and a sales engine and BDRs and creating lead flow and holy moly, if you can build that out, then your super expensive sales team, guess what? A hundred percent of their time, 100% can be spent doing the part of the sales cycle that they love. They're closing more. They're making a lot more money. You're making a lot more money. I'm done ranting. What are your thoughts on this? <laughs> you hit almost everything that I want to talk about now. Oh my God. Okay. So where do I start? <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, I think the most important thing is, is that people need to understand that marketing and sales is the same thing. Okay. Um, I know that back in the day, people were like, well, marketing does this and then sales does this. We don't talk, we hate each other. And marketing needs, is in charge of bringing in qualified leads and sales is in charge of closing. And, you know, and then when none of that stuff happens then everyone is you know, up in arms and just ticked off, those days are over. Today, it's, we have to be congruent. Today, marketing and sales are a team. Like in my opinion, if I'm gonna hire a salesperson, you better have knowledge and experience in how to do marketing correctly. Um, I'm not saying you have to be a marketing pro. You have to understand what marketing does, how it works, and how it can make your life easier, and vice versa. You know, marketing needs to see that, hey, if we're bringing in great people, 
sales is going to have the right tools on how to build off that message that marketing created. And then sales can come in and just kind of continue that same conversation and help close business. Because at the end of the day, like we're all helping each other achieve this common goal. So that's kind of, you know, my part on that end, as far as, as far as like, um, you know, some of the other you know, points that you kind of touched and, and having the sales unicorn, I do agree. I think those days are, are kind of long gone. And I think, um, what we need to start getting into is really start looking at our staff and our team and wondering where do they thrive? Where are they like, just like, give, like, let me destroy it here. And, and then don't give them anything outside of that realm. Okay. Let them just, whatever that is, if it's inbound sales and they just, every inbound call that comes in, they just know how to actually, you know, communicate, talk, and then get these people closed. They need to have, you know, that's what they do. They shouldn't be building their pipeline. They shouldn't be going out networking, you know, because maybe what it is is they just love being on the phone and talking to people and literally just solving problems for these people. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and, and then the other part of it too is that there's people that just love to literally go out there and hound the doors and go to networking events. Great. Then they should basically be building this pipeline, warming up an audience, and then slightly giving this stuff to these inbound people that just know how to close, you know, just easily. So my, my point, I guess, is where I'm trying to get to is, is that we need to start looking at this whole self-awareness of understanding where we, we thrive. I was reading this book by Michael Hyatt, Freedom to, Th Freedom to, what was it? Freedom to something, I forget. I literally just read it and now I just forgot because I'm on a podcast. But um, anyways, um, what it was is that he was talking about that we should be focusing our time on the things that we truly enjoy because otherwise, if we won't do it now, we won't do it later. That was something that he was really pointing out is look at your time and how you spend it. There are things that are on your things that you're really good at. That's what you should be focusing most of your time on. The things that you don't thrive in, that you don't want to do, like if you don't like to go get your own prospects, then you need to be doing something else. And so what I started doing at my old company and what I'm doing now here at our company is I revamped our website to where it was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was getting fresh, qualified leads that want to talk to us, okay? And I gave a very strong call to action, okay? And made that very clear. My next thing that I want to do for our company is creating lead magnets. And this is where it's a soft sell. It's a, hey, here's something for free. Just give me your email address. That's it. It's a fair exchange. And that needs to be implemented part of the sales process, even though that seems like it's, it's marketing. It's not. It's sales. Because the ultimate goal is to get this pipeline really, really big at the top, the top of the funnel to where they get qualified. They qualify themselves. And that's all created through automation, whether it's doing, you know, your BDRs follow up, whether it's, you know, get into the next level to the next stage where your inside sales team is just, you know, talking to those people and closing those deals, whatever it is that needs to be coming in. I mean, I remember at my old business, I was getting 30 plus leads a month, like clockwork every single month. I could bank on 30 leads. And this is how it was 30 leads a month. 15 of those would be actually talked to on the phone. 12 of those would be appointments. 10 of those would enroll. That was literally every single month. And I would not spend more than five minutes on my calls with these people on the phone. That's it. So like literally I pick up the phone and you know, sometimes they're like, what do you charge? I would find a way to navigate that and find out what the pain points are. If they're really stuck on that, then maybe they're not a fit. We move on. I don't set an appointment. Like it's just what it is. Now, whenever I hit a pain point, like, hey, is Johnny really having discipline problems? Is he really struggling at school? All of a sudden they start opening up. I'm like, great. You know what? I have an appointment. I have an availability at Tuesday at 530. How does that work for you? That's perfect. And then we set the appointment, we do the follow-up, and then we had a perfect system when it came to closing. So that could be done on the B2B side. It's the same thing. Now I'm not going to say you're going to have a five-minute conversation with these, these businesses, but you should have a prequal on, uh, that, that, you're, that you're with these people to understand what their pain points are because sometimes, you know, they might have some things that are just like, you don't want to deal with. You're like, wow, like you're, you, there's a lot of opportunity, but you have more problems than, you know, than, than, than I want to deal with. And, and then this is where we have to be prideful and, and be smart and say, hey, you know what? I think this is not going to be a fit because we really focus on this and this is where we thrive in. And I don't know if we can really solve all of your other problems that you have. You know, I, I might have a couple of recommendations. I'd love to help you, but, you know, I think this is what I would probably suggest. You know, if anything changes, we'd be happy to help you and you move on. So you didn't waste your time selling to somebody in there. But 
I do agree going back to the whole initial sales unicorn thing is that I think we need to start thinking about our, ourselves as where do we thrive in? Where, what lane do we just destroy and dominate um, that we get excited about? Like what makes you wake up in the morning? Like I cannot wait to talk to 10 people today that are fresh leads that want to do business with me. Cannot wait to do that. And then just start feeding those people or marketing people. They're like, I cannot wait to create more, make our, you know, our funnel really huge at the top so that our sales team is just closing and they're excited. So I think it's really about finding those, those salespeople and finding where they thrive. And then you have to get marketing involved. You, you have to get a marketing team inside, even if it's one person that understands that they both work together. Because if you have them see things differently, they're not going to be excited. Or you can hire sales BQ. Exactly. <laughs> to come in and handle your entire revenue engine while preserving what you have that is already great and phenomenal. It's not a rip and replace. Or if what you have is truly networking and it's built completely backwards, there's options for that too. But that's yep. a... That would be a great time to give us a call. Hey, this has been a very good podcast. The amount of information that's in here for people to understand, not only from building systems, but also why the alignment between sales and marketing is so critical. This was a great share. I am going to wrap us up so that our listeners can still love the fact that we try to keep our podcast under 30 minutes, which is, oh, funny, a typical drive time, except we're recording this, of course, in, uh, in March, which depending on when you're listening to this, maybe it'll bring you good memories or bad memories of when we were all in quarantine and we're driving anywhere. But anyway, I do want to keep it short. Javier, thank you so much for being on our show today. How do listeners stay in touch with you? Uh, easy. So a couple of places, uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, literally just LinkedIn is going to be Javier Lozano Jr. Or you can get my handle, which is at LinkedIn or linkedin.com slash in slash Javier Lozano Jr. Uh, so I'm pretty, pretty um, active on there. You can always find me on uh, Facebook as well too. Very active there. It's going to be at Javier Lozano Jr. That's going to be my handle there. Th those are kind of the two major platforms We've got a, other places that I, I kind of get in touch with, but if you want to kind of talk to me a little bit more, uh, see my mechanical when it comes to HVC refrigeration, or even if you just need help with just kind of like strategy, I'm happy to help and kind of point you in the right direction. However, I do agree that Mary is amazing at all this. So I would defer everything to her, but I love talking shop is basically what it boils down to. So I sometimes just talk to some people and, and just kind of point some things and then Next thing you know, I'm like trying to push things to where I think they would thrive more because at the end of the day, I still have a full-time job, you know? So <laughs> this is not like what Mary does is amazing. What I do works really well, but I love to kind of talk shop. You can always email me at jlozano at coloradomechanical.com and that's pretty much it. Amazing. And you know, everyone might have a little extra free time. So you can just talk to both of us. And then, <laughs> ha -ha, just kidding. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in today to this episode of the Quota Crusher podcast. Be sure if you haven't connected with me, find me on LinkedIn, Mary Grothy, G-R-O-T-H-E. I'm not on Facebook. I ditched that thing a long time ago. I can't <laughs> see in that platform. But you can also find me at Twitter. I do have my middle initial in there, Mary L. Grothy. And of course, if you listen to this via audio and you wanted to see the amazing video production that we just put on, head over to our YouTube channel. You can watch this. You can find it on our website. And if you watched us beautifully show up today, you could also just listen to the audio. If that's easier, you can go to salesbq.com slash podcast to find everywhere that our podcast is available. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll, we'll catch you on the next episode. 